Hi, everyone, and welcome once again. Um, this is a follow-up panel discussion for our previous event. Uh, before we get into the logistics for today's discussion, I'm going to ask that our panelists once again reintroduce themselves. Geert, we'll start with you. Hello, uh, my name is Geert de Pau, and I'm coordinator at Community Land Trust Brussels. Hello, I'm Jeanne Mosseret. Uh, I'm housing researcher at the VUB, Vrij Universiteit Brussels in Belgium, and I'm partner in the Upcycling Trust project that I have been presenting last time. Hello, Stacy Horwitz with the City of Lakes Community Land Trust in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I am currently the operations director for the organization. Thank you, folks. So before we get into our discussion, uh, uh, some housekeeping. Yes, this discussion will be recorded and we will be sharing it on our website and with folks who've registered for the event. It will be in English, but will feature French uh, subtitles. You can also find a recording of our previous webinar at our website, cltweb.org where you can find recordings and presentation slide decks for that previous webinar. And just a reminder to our audience, uh, please feel free to introduce yourselves using the chat feature in Zoom. And if you have any additional questions for today's discussion, please leave them in the Q&A box. If we have time, we'll try to get to them by the end of today's discussion. So, what do we want to do today? Um, first, we went through our intros and, and welcomes. I'll provide a content uh, context before we jump into the discussion. And then we'll have a panel discussion with our three panelists, uh, broken into three different topics, partnerships, scale and costs, and building community. And a, a programming note before I go forward, uh, what this webinar will not be is presentations delivering broad overviews of what these projects are. If you're looking for that information, please, uh, I urge you, watch the recordings of our previous webinar on this project, um, where you can find detailed overviews of each of these projects, their geographies, how they work, etc. For today, we want to use this opportunity to jump into a, a deeper discussion of the details. That being the case though, I am gonna provide you a little bit of context. So in our webinar last month, we explored the Upcycling Trust Partnership. Um, this is a European Union funded partnership between CLTs and regional governments in Europe that seeks to address new mandates for energy renovations. Oops, apologies. Bear with me, folks. Um, by using CLTs as the vehicle for this form of sustainability, more permanently affordable housing is created, addressing the housing and the climate crisis, but also most importantly, bringing equity and justice to climate change transition policy. The types of energy and building renovation policies available in Europe, much like elsewhere, often require investments that lower income tenants and owners can't afford. And one of the key challenges for CLTs, like CLTs Brussels in this project, is the challenge of bringing existing owners and tenants into a CLT, an experience not familiar to the dedicated staff and organizers there. In the spirit of learning and exchange, they reached out to Stacy Horowitz at City of Lakes Community Land Trust, a CLT with a long history of programs targeting existing homeowners and tenants to bring into a CLT. In her presentation, Stacy talked about Project Sustain Legacy. This is a program designed to intervene with elderly homeowners experiencing economic distress that was risking their tenancy. Project Sustain Legacy brings these owners and home into the land trust. Building trust with these owners was a key challenge for practice, 
And the success of the program can provide an example of how to build that trust with people who are not intending to seek out a CLT to resolve their issues. And so for today, what we want to do is make the space for our webinar speakers to engage in a deeper discussion about the challenges that their projects face. We also took all of the audience questions from our previous webinar and from our exit survey, and we use those to help shape the topics for this discussion. So your participation as the audience has helped us shape this conversation for today. So we'll break the discussion into three blocks. First, we'll talk about the role of partnerships. Second, we'll delve into the themes of cost and scale. And finally, we'll talk about building community with these groups of owners and tenants and how to move at the speed of trust, as Stacy has so eloquently put it during her presentation. So for our first discussion topic, partnerships, Partnerships are essential to both of the projects that were discussed in this previous webinar. And so to our panelists, what kind of partnerships have to be developed for projects like these to work successfully? What are the challenges that come with these partnerships? And I'll ask Geert to start us off on this discussion topic. Okay, thanks, Rich. Uh, so to start, I, I'll, I'll give some sentences of introduction about our community of interest in Brussels that will be easier to understand why we do the things we do. So our community land trust exists for uh, 13 years now. It is uh, uh, set up as a partnership, which is important, a partnership and a collaboration between uh, grassroots community uh, associations who are still uh, most of them involved in our daily operation. Uh, and in our board. Um, so while being an autonomous organization, we also benefit from uh, a strong partnership with the Brussels region who funds us and uh, uh, the main uh, investment funding comes from the Brussels region. So that's the context until now we mainly did um, new build operation and all, all, also always multifamily uh, development. So we have today uh, some 110 homes that are occupied, uh, 70 uh, under construction and, and some 50 uh, in the pipeline. Uh, and since a few years, we are also indeed, as you said, thinking about the possibility of reaching out to um, uh, existing homeowners who uh, live through difficult situations uh, because they don't have uh, the possibility to renovate uh, their homes and especially with the upcoming uh, new norms, uh, uh, new energy norms, we, we really believe that there's a big risk there. Uh, so um, as we always do, we try to set up uh, partnerships. Uh, also for this, uh, this upcycling trust project in Brussels. Um, and uh, it is in 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 different uh, on different uh, topics that we have partnerships. The the most important one is undoubtedly uh, with the um, uh, with a community organization uh, that uh, helps the homeowners uh, with uh, technical counseling and and social support. In Brussels, we have a network which is called Réseau Habitat Network Housing. Uh, and that is uh, specialized in, in this, they, they do uh, uh, organize counseling for, uh, for people who want to renovate their home and uh, they are really a, a strong partner. Uh, we work with the local, uh, local associations uh, in, so as we are at the very beginning of this project, we have two pilots that are uh, running now. And in both cases, it is a, an association that is called CAFA, uh, who, who does this uh, part of the job. Um, uh, what else? Well, one of the partnerships that we are we want to develop is with contractors. Uh, so that's we, we haven't done that yet, but uh, as it is quite a specific approach as we also would like to integrate circular 
uh, building techniques in in uh, in what we do. We are looking for for contractors who understand what we want to do and with with whom we can build a, a relationship of trust uh, to to do this. Uh, other partners is well probably banks uh, should be a partner and they're one of our main partners until now also for our uh, for our classical operations let's say is a is a social uh, mortgage uh, organization called Fonds de Logement with whom we have uh, developed a, a, a good collaboration uh, and so we'll have to think about uh, what the uh, uh, the consequences of this kind of approach on the uh, homeowners who still have a mortgage uh, could be, but there's also a question of how could what we do be combined with other uh, other um, forms of of support such as existing existing uh, renovation loans, for instance. So that's an important uh, partnership. Uh, and then finally, also, uh, what's important for us, as you said in your introduction, now we are in a pilot phase, but what we really want to do is to turn this into um, a governance prog program uh, that would be complementary of existing uh, forms of support, such as uh, subsidies, for instance. And in order to be able to reach that, it's very important to build coalitions uh, with others, um, we do that, for instance, uh, through the Upcycling Trust project with other European partners, um, but also in Brussels, we we are involved in coalitions of uh, uh, people, environmental uh, organizations, but also organizations for social justice, uh, and we try to uh, work with them also in order to uh, defend our our approach with a final goal but we'll come to that probably in the in the next question to convince also the the authorities to invest in these kind of programs thank you dear stacy i wonder if you could follow up on this um in our discussions on project sustain legacy what really came through was the nature of the the the, the relationship to non-housing government agencies um, to find homeowners who may be in distress. So I wonder if you could speak back to uh, you know Geert's aspiration here to turn this into a government program and speak to those relationships that that Project Sustain Legacy has had to build over the years. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, yes. So we actually, the original situation that came to us that really was the origin of Project Sustain Legacy was an executor of an estate who was looking for a solution for the person who was remaining in the home. And through a number of different conversations ended up at our organization. And we realized that while it wasn't something we normally did, that we could use community land trust strategy to help this individual stay in their home. And so essentially what we would normally assist someone with in affordability assistance, which is um, a sum of money that we would provide to help someone be able to afford a home, we were going to use a similar investment to keep the person in the home. And throughout that first one, all the way now 14, 15 years later, partnerships are critical to the success of Project Sustain Legacy. Our county, our city, our local jurisdictions play a key role in a number of different ways, not only with funding, but also with talking through situations where perhaps the city is putting orders on a house, meaning that they're requesting repairs because it's not up to standard. And oftentimes we can have a conversation with that regulatory body and ask them to give us the time to make the repairs so that the homeowner does not have 
more um, dollars and more uh, impact financially. Um, that has been very helpful. One of the things that's been really striking to us is that we're, with our local jurisdiction that manages property taxes, they actually started a program after about the fourth or fifth home that we did in partnership with them to help someone who was going to lose their home because they had not paid the property taxes. Um, they actually realized the, the two parts of their help that they usually bring, the, the property tax side and the, the human services side, so medical assistance, general assistance, those type of things, that if they had somebody who knew both parts of what they did, they could actually work with homeowners who were behind on property taxes, get them the support they needed and potentially prevent them from losing their home. And so for a while we were getting quite a few calls and referrals from that local jurisdiction. And once they implemented the program, they actually reduced the number of evictions and the number of individuals that were facing eviction. So it was something that came out of the partnership. And, and while it impacted the fact that we weren't helping as many people, there was actually kind of a, an impact to the system itself. Um, the other things that have been really important for us from a partnership perspective is the legal aid, which is our low, either low fee or no fee legal services that are available to people. They have referred people to us and they've also been the advocate and the legal representation for homeowners. That is a really important part of our relationship with a homeowner who is coming in through Project Sustain Legacy um, because it is, it doesn't wanna be seen as predatory that you're really trying to be in a position to help a homeowner stay in their home. And so that legal partnership where there is someone who can be present to answer questions and to be a third party is really important in this process. And to what my colleague Garrett said around contractors, that has been key because we have had some really difficult situations with homes. In one in particular, for an example, there was no um, running water in the home except for where it came into the main line of the house. So in the rest of the house, it wasn't, the water was coming into the house, but the rest of the plumbing had been impacted. That normally, <clears throat> excuse me, for our city would require that the person be moved out and the house condemned. But because of the relationships we have with contractors, we were able to be positioned to close on the home and have a contractor have the plumbing done before the city would have to come in and inspect. So we could prevent the displacement and we could not have the home condemned, but we could not have accomplished that without that contractor relationship. And I think just thinking through the whole process each step of the way, essentially, we have to have effective partnerships, not just for funding, but for title work, for legal, for regulatory, for all of that. So when you think about partnerships, it's the whole process. There's somebody you're partnering with. And to develop those and maintain those and have trusted ones is, is really key. For those reflections, Stacy, and and I think it's, I think it says a lot about the success of sustained legacy that it's pushed government authorities to to rethink their their own practice around service uh, to citizens in distress. Um, Jean, you're coming to this from the perspective of of a researcher. Share with us some of your reflections on, on, on this topic of partnerships in the Upcycling Trust Partnership. Yeah, I, 
Now I have many questions to Stacy, but I, to, I will come back to that then. Um, I don't know if it's, a, if it's as a researcher, but uh, indeed, and, and this came back in Geert and Stacy, this, this question of, um, in a way, having, having partnership, having local or having partner that knows who we are addressing. Um, it seems that, um, and I have been discussing now with our colleagues from Ghent, uh, on one of our partners in, in, in the upcycling project, uh, where um, they have been already working with uh, homeowner in the past, and um, in Belgium, in Flanders, they have been uh, advocating a lot to make it recognize uh, the situation of uh, uh, low income homeowners that they called um, emergency buyer, distress buyer, or, or cap captive resident. Um, and it seems that it 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 was a real uh, yeah a real uh, 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 struggle for them to make it recognized in, in Belgium. And this can be can be can be associated as a, as one step. As soon as we realize that we are addressing a specific uh, a specific audience, then there is also uh, potentially specific partner that could help us to to better understand who we are addressing. And this is quite um, specific for this upcycling project because, as we said, all our partners so far have been developing new houses uh, for um, rather people addressing, more classically addressing social housing. Um, and also compared to, and in addition to that, in Belgium, Generally, we will uh, uh, consider that someone that owns a house is already not poor, is already <laughs> at the limit of, of a certain richness. And discussing with this 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 partner of of, of Ghent, uh, he, he could he pointed at uh, the, a very really important partnership they had with the social service provider of the municipality um, that were really the ones um, that the. the that are the ones that are part of the of the system of the governmental system that actually accumulate a certain knowledge on on this person but didn't have any places or any moment to to help them or to or to uh, react to them and it, it's a little bit what Stacy was pointing at and 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 they needed this this partnership or this moment of discussion to realize that they, they that this service was in facing a certain need that what the, the the classical subsidies, the classical support, the classical social benefits they will provide was wasn't able to help them because because we we we, we because in 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 Belgium we don't uh, uh, consider this 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 homeowner as being uh, in need in a certain way. I, I make it a bit caricatural, but uh, uh, and then thanks to this discussion, they could then realize that uh, that uh, it was uh, first of all there is, there is something to do there, <laughs> and also the, the 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 social service provider could then be a, a real a partner on explaining who we are addressing and and helping to then uh, um, um, uh, format or 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 or, or deliver a, a, a project or product that could help um, real yeah. Real people. So I, I really realized that uh, yeah, this partnership of having expert that knows who we are addressing, it can be really uh, uh, important. And and I, I I'm realizing that. <laughs> um, that uh, yeah, that's for that. But I was then if I could look at Stacy because now it's it's you. Seems that yeah, this partnership seems to be easy. <laughs> To do or when you say we have we have a legal contract we have a, a partnership with a legal um, agency then with this contractor etc etc I was wondering if if for how long are this partnership and and how were you able then to to discover them to create them um, for example this contractor did they appear to be a, a, an answer to your specific need or thanks to your network yeah. Yeah, I think one of the things, because oftentimes we're talking about Project Sustain Legacy itself, and it is one element of the work that we do. And we started in 2002 as an organization. We didn't do our first 
We didn't help our first homeowner through Project Sustain Legacy until 2010. And it wasn't even really Project Sustain Legacy <laughs> at that time. Um, it, we had been doing a buyer initiated program where we were helping individuals and families purchase homes. So we had about four or five years of experience as an organization helping individuals into new home ownership. <clears throat> and part of that was doing post-purchase rehab on the homes for deferred maintenance once the homes became part of the land trust. So we had about four years of relationship with contractors. And in 2010 was the first homeowner that we helped stay in their home, the existing homeowner. And <clears throat> we would have maybe one or two a year. And after about the fourth or fifth situation, and most of those early on were individuals that were going to lose their home because they were behind on the property tax. And after helping about a half dozen homeowners, we realized we actually have maybe a program to add to the work that we were doing. And that's really how we more put more formal parameters, had learned some lessons about how to actually help an existing homeowner, things that we needed to look at from a due diligence standpoint, and really could frame out a structure of how do we manage when either someone is referred to us or a homeowner seeks us out individually. And that's really where Project Sustain Legacy, I would say around 2015, 2016, became more formal as a program versus, you know, the first few, it was like, yes, we can do this because we have this amazing tool. And now, like, let's really start to build out those partnerships. But many of the partnerships we had in place because of the other work we were doing. And then we've cultivated those other relationships as Project Sustain Legacy has evolved. I would say legal aid, the, the legal services, there was a lot of discussion so that they could understand that we were not going to take the home from the homeowner, like to really understand what we were doing and actually became a strong advocate for us in those relationships because they saw the solution through the land trust as a holistic solution for that homeowner. We have resources to help individuals and families that may be facing some financial challenge, but through Project Sustain Legacy, we also address a lot of the deferred maintenance and things on a home that may also keep somebody in a precarious financial situation if they're paying really high utility bills or they don't have heat or they don't have plumbing. So it becomes a more comprehensive solution than just helping somebody pay off their taxes. That's not truly stabilizing and helping a home owner be positioned to sustain a home. You're really just solving for that immediate situation and not the long term. And what we're trying to do with Project Sustain Legacy is solve for the long term by addressing the immediate and then doing some work to address things that will position a homeowner more beneficially long term. Okay. John, if you have any follow ups, please feel free to ask them. It's because. I looked back at uh, a previous presentation and today you didn't mention so much this question of the banks or funders. Um, mm -hmm. And last time you really mentioned that that this funder need to learn to be patient. Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> and yeah. I was yeah, I was interested in in that and and do you then are, have you been able to teach them to be patient or did you simply from the right person that was patient. Oh, yeah. That's a great question. And, and for um, just a little bit of context, um, I mentioned in the original presentation that our funding sources and also 
our local jurisdictions, especially the regulatory services area, we've learned that we we're really asking them to be patient. Um, you know, Richard said this at the beginning that the the phrase that we use a lot is moving at the speed of trust. And that doesn't always happen with one or two conversations. And, and we've learned with Project Sustain Legacy that sometimes we're talking for two years with a homeowner that if they're not in an immediate financial need, but know that they need a longer term solution, um, we need to kind of walk through that because their personal situation they need to think through whether or not maybe other resources that they're getting may or may not be impacted if they work with the land trust. So we've got a lot of layers. And usually when people come to us and it's a financial situation that they are facing, we've learned that that's really just the, the first layer. And when you start to build that relationship, there could be past due utilities. There could be some other liens on the house. There's there's these other layers that you you as the organization really need to understand. And that can take time. And it can take time for someone to truly know that you are not going to take their house from them. That is not your intent and that's not your goal as an organization. So we have had conversation because um, I would say we also are working with individuals, not in all cases, but in probably about a third of the homeowners we've helped. There are, um, we're aware of mental health challenges as well. And if someone has been under this pressure financially and under pressure from a regulatory body, and now they feel like they're maybe making a step forward, but our city comes in and says, you now have $500 more in repairs that you need to do. We have seen them really just back off. And so we have to start to rebuild the relationship again. And, and that really was one of the situations where we went to our regulatory services, the people who put those repair orders on homes and said, we need you to be patient. We need you to give us the time to do the repairs because just like we have to build the trust to get to a point where someone agrees to have their home become part of the land trust, we also have to build the trust that we're going to come in and do repairs. And frankly, even though we know that what we're offering may put someone in a better position, we are asking to come into their space that they are very comfortable in, and in many cases is their safe space, and we're going to change it. That can take time too. So we can't just march in and go, we're just gonna fix your roof, right? We need to make sure they're on board with that conversation. And while the city would love us to just go in and start making all the repairs that they see, we can't do that unless we are in agreement with that homeowner to do those repairs and that they are trusting that we're going to come in and do it well. Um, so I think to your point about the patient it's, and the funders, because the funders have specific timelines and we've had to ask them, you know, please give us as much flexibility as you can. We will spend the dollars. <laughs> We just maybe can't spend it in the two months you want us to spend it. So what can we do in partnership to figure out how to meet their objectives, be respectful of the homeowner we're working with, and still get everything squared away? And that's where that patience comes in. And, and that really is, that's where partnership becomes so critical, is to have, be able to have those conversations and have that support. Yeah, this, just, just as an example, it, we had one situation where four years before we had an executed agreement on rehab. So just <laughs> as a good example about patients. <clears throat> so transitioning to 
another topic, mm -hmm. scale and cost. But one that's, I think, related to some of the things that you're, you're talking about, Stacey, but here I want to throw it back to gear um, in terms of scale and, and cost. And, and one of the challenges, and, and gear, I'd like you to reflect on this both in terms of the cost of doing the work that would be required in the upcycling trust partnership. But I, if you could also reflect a little bit on the cost that is imposed on a low income homeowner or tenant when it comes to these climate change mandates that are coming down and how the CLT, specifically CLT Brussels in, in the reno pack that Virginie presented on, how you're approaching um, absorbing those costs for low income and vulnerable owners? Uh, well, uh, in Brussels, as everywhere in Europe, uh, we, we, we will have to reach uh, new standards uh, to, uh, to lower carbon emissions, as you know, uh, uh, housing and the built environment is one of the biggest uh, polluters in terms of uh, carbon. And so there are a, a set of rules uh, that are that will be become mandatory uh, the coming years. And 2030 is there an important year. Uh, and then gradually, every every couple of years, the the norms will uh, increase and it will become uh, more and more. Uh, uh, strict. Um, so uh, we really believe that uh, this will be a major problem. As, as uh, Jeanne explained, we have in Belgium a lot of um, poor homeowners, people who bought a home because we have not a lot of social housing here. And uh, until, let's say, 20 or even 10 years ago, it was probably the only option uh, if you were uh, uh, a bigger family with a lot of children and a, a low income and you wanted to stay in Brussels, well, you could, uh, you could with a social mortgage, buy a home, but you couldn't find something um, uh, rental uh, near public, near uh, on the private market. And that last part hasn't changed. There are no new alternatives today. So what will happen if these people uh, who... Uh, who bought a home as the only solution will be forced to um, to do investments that they don't have the money for. Well, they'll have to sell their home probably on a, on the, under the market price uh, because well uh, a, a, a home that doesn't uh, reach the standards uh, will not sell for a high price and they'll have to leave the city. I think that's really what will what will happen. Um, so this is really a major problem. Um, uh, so that's to, to the first part of your question. Uh, secondly, how much does it cost uh, for for us uh, to renovate the, these homes? Of course, it it depends. Uh, but uh, well, first of all, as I said, or as you can guess, a lot of these homes are in very poor quality. And th these people didn't buy the <laughs> high quality homes. They bought uh, homes that are already were uh, under standard. So there, there's, there's that. And then um, we also uh, aim uh, with, with, our, with our program to bring the homes immediately up to standard for the the future, so so that not we 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 don't aim, aim uh, intermediary uh, standards. We we want to do it uh, uh, so that uh, we we reach the 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 final uh, standards. In fact, so uh, that means that it is uh, quite expensive. Uh, according to the size of the homes, we could estimate that it's somewhere between 50,000 and 100,000 uh, only or, or mainly for the, for the uh, energy uh, renovation. But then 
most of these homes have also other uh, issues of, of of quality and safety that has to have to be addressed. So, and there it's difficult to put a price on it, but um, but it could be uh, the double, for instance, which is really which which makes it really uh, an expensive uh, a program, clearly. Uh, but um, well, you you have to compare it to. Uh, to, to other things, we one other element in Brussels is that we we, as as I said, we have very uh, few social housing, and it becomes more and more difficult to build extra social housing as Brussels is already uh, filled. Let's say there is not so many uh, open open space left where we can build. So so this could be a way uh, not only to uh, well that maybe our key message is that. But through this program, we we will uh, tackle different issues, and the impact will be much higher. It's not only about uh, 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 climate policy; it's also about housing policy. It's also about urban policy, uh, and so that's uh, where we think that uh, even if it could seem uh, expensive, in fact. It is not as it addresses all these questions uh, at the same time. Uh, so, of course, uh, it, here in Belgium, as in many other countries, we, we have to deal with uh, difficult uh, budgetary situations. Uh, so that will be really uh, one of the main questions. How can we convince uh, the authorities uh, that mostly think within their own uh, uh, within their own competences, and it's always more difficult if you want to uh, uh, defend a holistic approach because everyone says, "Oh, but I'm, I'm only the, the energy department will say I'm I'm uh, I'm only concerned by uh, how much uh, CO CO2 we will uh, uh, win, and and housing is not my business." So that will be really uh, uh, an important uh, uh, issue. Um, we also, one of the advantages uh, is that uh, the European Union made of housing, uh, uh, first of all, of, of climate, a very important uh, uh, priority. Uh, and in fact, uh, since uh, this new commission, there is also a commissioner on housing uh, for the first time until now, Europe wasn't really very concerned about housing, but now they, 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 there is a commissioner about housing who is also attached to the to the energy department. So there is, I, I, I believe, uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, reality there uh, where we could be able to convince how both uh, how both topics are very closely uh, connected. Um, and then finally, also, uh, I think it's also important to uh, not to forget that who, the, um, the people and the homes that we are uh, addressing here are the most complicated situations. It is, uh, as I said, people who don't have alternatives uh, uh, for quality housing, but to stay live where they live. And homes that uh, are of probably of the most difficult to bring up to standards. So, so I think it's important to also have that in mind. Uh, and then uh, that brings me to the scale uh, of the operation. Of course, uh, there are hundreds of thousands of homes that need to be renovated in Brussels uh, uh, within the coming home uh, within the coming years. We are not going to. Uh, to help all, all these homeowners. But what we would like to do is um, uh, between now and 2030, when these new uh, norms will become um, uh, uh, not, <laughs> uh, to have the possibility to test in a, in a few other situations, uh, configurations, uh, so that we could, uh, the, the, the coming years, do uh, let's say two projects a year help two homeowners a year and to be ready then in 2030 uh, to to scale it up and we believe that this approach could be uh, 
uh, used for, let's say, a thousand homeowners. Uh, but of course, this is just a, a, a gut feeling. But but uh, I mean, I, this, this seems quite uh, reasonable. John. I was hoping that you could provide some reflections on this question, given the unique context of, of France, right? Where in the French context, the French government has a, a bigger role, or government authorities have a bigger role in the partnership. How does this issue come up for the main actors of the upcycling trust partnership in, in the French context? Um, it is not that clear for me yet <laughs> how all this come together. Um, but what is clear is that in the, our two French pilots, they are um, addressing very, as Geert was saying for Brussels, they are also, both of, of the Lille and Hen pilots are also addressing really difficult situation. In the case of, of Lille, uh, they they are they are working on a neighborhood of uh, a bit bit less than hundred houses, but very really substandard small houses, where there is, there is no question of only uh, 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 energetical renovation. It's not it's 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 difficult to imagine to invest in these houses uh, uh, to only uh, uh, um, uh, retrofit them. Uh, uh, for sure, there is a question of of the size of the. Um, but which is which is a major question for them, but which is not <laughs> uh, um, uh, uh, finished. But I, I'm I don't I'm I don't know in in terms of of uh, funding support for the case of Lille specifically uh, uh, if they could really uh, um, uh, how much how much they can count on on additional support let's say because they they are uh, uh, um, institutional actors but for example in the case of of uh, ren where they uh, really the pilot is to um, renovate high rise housing so in that case also we cannot it's not one it's not unit per unit that and, and it's not a, a roof and and the phasing of the, the the renovation and the cost of this renovation is is totally different. Um, in their case, in the hand, they already have the the experience of renovating high rise social housing, where then there is one owner of the entire building, and so they have the, they they have a knowledge of how much uh, uh, it costs, and 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 they have a knowledge of the entire process. Um, so building on that, they have been already uh, uh, um, uh, mentioning how how they could potentially uh, rely on on other uh, uh, subsidies that the the the, the region uh, the, 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 and, and the, the country because it's these are national uh, 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 program often um, could probably support them um, in part of it but each time it's each time the same question of how this public money can be invested in private <laughs> privately or uh, private privately owned houses or pr pr property um and um I, i'm not i'm not really an expert in that but i i see that the, that yes it's uh, uh there is a real question there but um we will learn out of all this this the the, the yeah the typology and the situ the each situation are very diverse but are, are really really challenging uh uh in terms of 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 cost and type of renovation um, that but we we don't know yet. <laughs> ah, okay. Here. No, I just wanted to add something that I didn't mention. Uh, but indeed, uh, Jeanne and me, we are mainly talking about public money in, until now. I think that's really very important. But we we are also interested in in looking into how uh, other forms of, of, uh, of private funding could complete these programs, because really we, we need uh, innovations there too. So if uh, people have ideas, we would uh, welcome them very, very much. Because maybe there are examples that can be combined with, with, with our approach. Uh, I believe that if we have uh, 
I mean, without public money, I don't think it's possible, but this public money could also be used as a leverage for other programs to, to complete. Uh, but that's also one of the things we want to study uh, in this, in this uh, upcycling trust collaboration. So we have about eight minutes left. We still have one discussion topic, so I'll ask you each to just spend a minute or two reflecting on this topic, but this is building community. And I'll start with Geert. Geert, in last month's webinar, Virginie talked about the psychological barriers that CLT Brussels encounters when um, engaging with these existing tenants. And as Virginie put it, they often felt dispossessed and or uh, because the CLT model was not well known or recognized. Um, talk a little bit about those barriers and how CLT Brussels is talking to those tenants and how they're trying to get around the, those types of psychological barriers. Okay, uh, interesting question. It It is mainly, it's not tenants, but homeowners. M most of the people we are working with here. Uh, and what's interesting is that uh, in our new uh, developments, uh, where we build multi multi-family uh, homes, uh, we hardly have any questions about, about uh, the form of tenure. In, in fact, all of our uh, homeowners uh not only accept but a lot of them really uh uh recognize uh why we 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 do it the way we do uh, you know with the uh, with the uh, the the landing community ownership etc uh and there it it almost never has been an issue uh of course it's very different when when you uh talk to someone who already is a homeowner uh and uh but i think well stacy explained it uh, very good it's a matter of of building trust of taking time uh and one of the things we would like to do is uh to connect these homeowners uh, these uh within the this new program with existing homeowners who live on community land uh and I think this is really uh, will be really uh, important uh, because it make it will make it much more easy for people to uh, to understand how it works, also to trust it, or to to um, to understand that it's not uh, we don't try to uh, uh, take their home. No, we 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 want to uh, make it possible that they stay in their in their home. And so connecting the these these new homeowners homeowners with the existing homeowners uh, will be uh, very uh, important, I think. And that's also one of the reasons why uh, we want to think about ways of uh, extending the community of and 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 bringing these new homeowners homeowners in our community. And, and I would just echo that um, if I, I'll just take a minute. Um, I think we're very fortunate in that we have a full-time person whose primary role is to engage homeowners. And that really allows that continuation of the relationship um, at, through trainings, through events that we do, but even making sure that they're connected with resources, um, partly because we do know their situation and granted it changes over time, but because we have the relationship, we're often getting the first phone call if there's a question, if there's additional resources that are needed. And so we do recognize we're in a unique position in that we have someone who's specific to that role, but it is critical and it goes back to the relationship. And so if you have that relationship during the process and you have the capacity to continue the relationship, you make those connections, not just between homeowners, but between the organization and the homeowner, between the homeowner and the community and the homeowner 
to homeowner connections, all of which are really critical. And I think that's how you ensure people stay connected as much as they want to be and also respect those who don't want to be connected to us until they're ready to sell or until they need our support. And so it is always that balance of understanding what an individual or family wants and then being present to respond to that as best possible. Thank you, Stacey. Sean, any final reflections? It's not a reflection, but uh, Stacey, you mentioned, so one full-time for the homeowner, does that mean that we mentioned last time you had nine full-time equivalent, I think, something like that? Oh, we have, organization? yeah, eight, I think it is eight, and then we have some contracted positions, yes. Okay, but so this is out of these eight or nine that you have one full-time for this homeowner contact. Uh, for all of our homeowners, and we have about 400 homeowners, just a little over 400 okay. homeowners right now. Okay. And we are recognizing that she's getting maxed out. <laughs> so okay. now because this is also about about that about this these services if we can call it like that mm -hmm. that is offered together with the the clt project uh, if we compare it to classical or the way we organize social housing for example in, in brussels this is really something uh, uh, uh great in in clt but that also it's a question of of money at the end uh, to recognize that and to to defend that also as part of uh, of the entire project. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we're at the hour. I want to thank our panelists for all of the amazing work that they've done participating and preparing for uh, this set of, of webinars this extended discussion.